Welcome to CTO Think, a podcast about leadership, product development, and tech decisions between two recovering chief technology officers. Here are your hosts, Don Vandemark and Randy Burgess. Hey, Don, what's going on? Hey, not a lot. Um, This is one of those weeks, uh, and actually including the weekend, where uh, struggling a bit with um, uh, motivation, I guess, is the right word, but but you know, just kind of one of those funks um, where you got things to do, but none of it looks all, all that appealing at the moment. So <laughs> yeah. been trying to work through that, but, uh, but good overall. How about you? Do you think it's due to burnout? I think it's always due to burnout. Um, when, 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 when you're trying to do five different things at, at any one time, you, you get to a point where it's, you, you've, you've burned out on that. So, um, yeah, and I, I've just been trying to take it easy on making progress on a lot of stuff. So, um, I'll, I'll probably be out of the funk by the weekend. <laughs> uh, for me, not look, basically been working on, code um i mean it's been a short week with holiday and stuff but uh react native and firebase and trying to make authentication work smoothly and correctly has been kind of my main focus a lot of little side projects as usual um, but for the most part a lot of hands-on coding this week at least um, okay cool so this week i wanted to talk about something that has for whatever reason, come up a couple times for me in conversations with people. <clears throat> twi- like t- twi- two or three times, can't remember how many this w- past week, someone has asked me, what do you do? Um, like you're a, like, I'll say I'm a developer, but they're like, well, like, what do you work on? What do you, why do people hire you? And it, almost inevitably I say, well, I'm a person that can talk to multiple stakeholders in a project or at a company. And that's what the conversation we have focuses on the most, more than what do I code and everything. So today I wanted to talk about the stakeholders that a technology leader has to talk to and some of the differences between those particular people. So I've got a short list I've written down. You can tell me if I've left out anybody, but it's not really short. It's maybe I have eight entries right now. might be more like seven, I think. But first stakeholders are executives. And these are people, I would call them CEOs, CTOs, the people that founded the company, the people that are in charge that you probably answer to. Um, or are on the kind of peer level of the management ladder. Um, That's one group. Another one would be investors, people that are outside the company. They are making an investment in the company. And if you are a technology person these days, that pro- the product that the company is selling may depend on that technology a lot. And people make putting money into the company have an interest. And so they may talk to you. Regulators, we've talked a lot about GDPR the last couple weeks, especially last week's episode. And you could have the SEC, the, you know, security compliance, um, privacy compliance, that kind of thing. The engineers on your team, um, that would be the coders, developers, testers, people that are working with you or for you on the project to actually do the coding, programming, and what have you. Um, Then I've got users, and I've got two sets of those. I've got current users, of people utilizing the platform or the product that your company provides, and potential users, people that may need to be convinced they should use it. Um, Those are two distinct groups uh, in my experience. And that 
I can't think of any other particular group. There's all their subsets, but I don't know if you have anybody off the top of your head that you consider a stakeholder group with significant difference between others. Well, it, it's interesting. So I, I, I have a couple, um, but I want, I want to take a little side detour for a minute because uh, the word stakeholder itself is actually uh, an interesting word. What does it actually mean? Um, it's the holder of a stake and yeah. then you have to go further and define what a stake is. So I was trying to flip through definitions, um, and the origins of the word as, as you were talking and it, it's, um, it's going to take some more reading. So <laughs> we won't have that here. Um, but, I, uh, I but use that term here. for a reason because in my mind, um, yeah, you could say stakeholders are people that own shares or people that have invested. Right, right. But and, I, and, and that's not the general definition, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, my definition of stakeholder has always been anyone that has a use usefulness out of the company of any sort in, from using the product and the benefits that come from it, from their job is to regulate, like their job is dependent on enforcing regulation or compliance or catching your company doing something wrong. They're, like people have a stake in that. Um, engineers have a stake in it from their livelihood and work. Executives and investors put money in the company typically, or they, you know, their job and livelihood depend on the success. So I put stakeholders as, I, I guess I use the term stake um, very loosely and what someone depends upon the company. So you could put, you could call it dependence, but I think that sounds bad in the sense. No, of- no, it, it, it's weird because I, I, listen, I worked for IBM. I, I've used the word stakeholders a yeah. thousand times. So uh, it, it's just, I never really thought about the etymology of it. Um, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up this little side detour of it. Um, the best, uh, the best uh, origin I can find of it is it's a person who holds the stakes of betters. So if two people are making a bet, it's the person <clears throat> who holds that bet while the outcome is being determined. So yeah. it's essentially an escrow agent. Um, the other alternate definition I saw, which is more along your lines, is anyone who can ruin your day. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, so the, uh, as you were talking, um, the only t- other two I came up with was maybe peers, peer managers, peer, peer. Uh, so you talked about executives potentially above you. You talked about engineers potentially below you. You also have those at your level that are in other departments potentially. Yeah. Um, and then you mentioned users. Um, I, I it, Without saying press, I'll say press. Um, so yeah, media. those who report on the media, those who report on the goings on of your company. Yeah. I think that's, um, the, that's a solid also, one I left off. Definitely. Um, that, that, that's one as well that, that could go in there. But other than that, I think, I think we've encompassed just, uh, it, without saying everyone we've encompassed, uh, a good amount of groups. Yeah. The, uh, going back in history of my history, I have commonly been hired to replace previous managers. And almost every time when I ask the question, what are you looking for from me to improve upon from the previous person's experience here? They say, we need to be able to talk to you because we weren't able to talk to the person in the role before you, or we never knew what the other person was doing, or we can never, sure. we never knew how to bring problems to that person or um, communicate about issues or ask for things. Like we need to be able to talk to a human being despite all this fact that we don't know anything you do. And so that's, I can't, it's really been a more than four or five times, I think, that I've been in roles where that was explicitly part of the goals for me to solve that previous communication issue. 
And so interesting. Um, yeah. So that that's where, and I again I tell this to my students all the time: your ability to code is only a fraction of the job. Your ability to communicate to all these different people is a vital part for you to, if you want to move up out of working in a corner and just being a coder. If you want to be a developer, right. you have to be able to communicate and talk to all these different people that have all different motivations and, and different motivations, different goals, different criteria upon which they're judged. You have to understand all that. We talk about empathy all the time. It's very much including an empathy in there of the empathy for all these people and why are they yelling at you about the tech? Um, understanding that and being able to respond to exactly what they're trying to ask and get at. So right. <clears throat> that is a in a nutshell the discussion, but. I guess I wanted to break, start breaking down the experiences that we have with these different groups um, and just see if we have a consensus or difference of experience doing that. And sure. I'll start with executives, the people that may hire you, the people that are your peers, the people that have a much a very important function for the company outside of tech, but it all ties to, to them to some degree. What's been your experience talking to executives in your career versus other parties? Well, I think, I, I think it's too, I think for the most part, the, the responsibility of the job is twofold. Um, one is communication. One is taking the technical and making it easier to digest for the non-technical. Um, and hand in hand with that is taking the technical and taking the responsibility of the technical. Um, one example of that is is what what we're working through right now with Aspire Edu, and we talked last time about regulations and all that and. And we've moved on from GDPR in that we've pretty much set everything in place that we're going to set in place. Um, and we think we're in good shape. We've moved on to the other thing I was talking about, which was all these security certifications. So we're, we're starting to work through, if not going and paying the thousands of dollars to actually be certified, at least self-certifying. So that if we turn around and decide to certify at some point, we're ready. Um, and that involves a lot of digging into um, some some very dense uh, documentation and working through it. So the stakeholders, the, the executives don't aren't going to want to dive through into it themselves. Um, that that becomes the responsibility of the of the department involved. And since it's an IT process, it's it's. Fully, fully falls on my shoulders. Yeah. So I, I think those are the two things. It's just communication and then taking responsibility. Well, I, I think to add to that, because I agree with all of those points, I've always found that when I work with executives, I'm dealing with people that have a much more limited amount of time. They typically are in meetings a lot more than other people in the company. They have significant responsibilities that are probably of higher, um, of more importance for the company, for the product and company. And so conversations with them are more brief. They on purpose lack detail, like sending long emails to executives means I don't get people reading and knowing the important points. Scanning emails by executive or communications, everything has to be brief, concise. It has to be bullet pointed. It has to be to the point. Um, and that's a big key. As I've worked with more and more executives, I found it like my communications had to really slim down. Uh, the other thing would be 
understanding and what the you have to tr- go straight to what do you want out of this conversation, out of this meeting, out of this project. <clears throat> they are looking for the end result and they're focused more on that. The inner details is something they just the how it how the sausage is made unless that's really under their responsibility, it's irrelevant. And like you said, it's on your shoulders to make those details work and be in compliance and be bit like efficient and such. But in exec- at the executive level, they don't care about that stuff or they just don't have time to focus on it. Um, yeah, single- they have other priorities. For yeah, sure. exactly. They're very single minded in some ways. Rightfully so, because their job is managing a whole subset of things that you shouldn't really care about as much. Um, I've always been curious when I see a, a CTO with their hands in the HR jar a ton. And I'm like, I know it's important that you get employees um, hired and stable, but you can't run HR. Like you, That's an area that you have to at least give a significant amount of leverage or of autonomy to. Because you, that's a full time job, and your job is to run other things. Um, and I guess the tone is another item with executives I found to be very important, or you, being able to judge the tone, especially when it comes to an executive that's higher up than you. Um, I, I've worked for folks where the first week I started working with them, I would send an email that was three paragraphs and get a one word answer back. Yes. And I was like, Whoa, I needed three answers out of that. And I got one and it doesn't even seem to be answering. It was a binary answer out of a multi choice question. And I, in the, and I first was kind of taken aback. I thought that the tone was um, kind of like, waving off my concerns. And what I really learned was, nope, this is how this entire executive team communicates. Keep the email short, expect very short answers back. And so I had to break up things. And so every executive will change, like the communications will change between people. But I have found over the years that um, it's a much shorter conversation with much more goal oriented discussions rather than detail oriented, which is what we are more, you know, used to on the engineering side. Um, The next one would be investors, people that you're some, like I am sometimes brought into meetings with investors because they want to put a, a financial stake into the company but they want to understand, I kind of want to know how the sausage is made and the risk involved. Uh, what's been your experience talking to those folks? Well, in, in a lot of cases, depending on where the, uh, on the investor, this is where, um, <laughs> for, for lack of a better word, um, you're that, you're not going to be able to uh, to pull the wo- to pull the wool over their eyes. You're not going to be able to dissemble. I guess yeah. is the best way to put it. Um, as much as maybe with a non technical executive, because sometimes you have technical investors. Um, so this this is where I find you get the most. Um, you're you're going to get challenged a lot um, on the details uh, sometimes. So they they want the same things. They want you to be able to communicate. They want you to be able to take responsibility. But in some cases, you have technical investors, so they're going to get down in the details and in the weeds sometimes. Yeah, um, that's not an all all the time thing, but it certainly happens. Um, yeah. But other I, than that, I think the communication is similar. You just sometimes have to be a little bit more on your toes. Yeah, I mean it's a it's kind of a sales job in a way because you don't know them. You know that usually you're given a heads up. This is someone we need to make a we want this person to make an investment in the company. And 
you know, at least in the technology realm these days, if it's a venture capitalist or an angel investor, they're concerned about you and if you're going to hang around. So I've always found that I'm answering questions about myself that I'm like, why does this matter? And then I realize, oh, they are afraid that if they put in a million bucks into this company and then I bolt that everything falls apart. So I kind of make a point of talking about the, you know, alleviating the hit. I'm hit by a bus problem. What else happens? And I talk about how the team is set up and how I'm not the only one holding all the keys to all the, to the deployment process and things like that. And that's, you know, that's a big risk for an investor is that the tech team dissolves in the middle of their investment. And so I found that like I, the fears, like investors to me come in with fears and they come in with risk things. And so I always find my conversations with investors leaning on a risk management and fear abatement side of things. Um, sometimes they worry about the code, but really, I rarely talk about code choices and stuff unless the investor has a background in it themselves, and they usually don't. And so that's not their biggest concern. They're really, they're, that's, ne- that's just not what I end up talking to them about that much. Yeah, and I, I don't know that I was necessarily saying they're going to sit down there and break down lines of code with you. Yeah. It was more... Um, technical decisions you've made could end up being questioned for technical reasons more than with non-technical executives. Yeah. Um, let's talk about regulators. That goes into our conversation oh. last week. Um, they come in various forms. Sometimes you're talking to, like I had to talk to met folks with the SEC when I worked for a finance firm. Um, they were usually brief, and my company tried to shield me from those discussions as much as possible. But every once in a while, I'd end up interviewing with regulators, asking some questions about how data was handled, reporting, that kind of thing. And then you have the people that come to you with a survey, and it's a long list of questions related to privacy. Like, you've done this way more recently than I have. What's been your experience talking to people on that side? So I haven't had a lot of experience in talking to actual regulators, um, actual people who are responsible for the laws and, and, and standards and regulations. Um, it's been more about putting things in place so that when those conversations potentially happen, we're in a good place to have those conversations. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I would say I just haven't even had that experience yet. Um, but that, that deals more with the, the, um, the boundary between technology and legal. Um, so as, as you stated, um, when we were talking about regulations, it's more about not stepping out of your depth. Yeah. Um, yeah making sure that you don't overstep what you know, you raise your hand when you get to a point of, I don't know. um, And going forward from there. Yeah. I, I I truly find myself and, and I put, when I say regulators, I could mean the random person at a client who is in charge of compliance. They don't understand to me. That's a regulator in the sense of the relationship that I'm now having with that person. Um, Sure. But I find myself in that mode of saying, I don't know a good amount and I can look it up if you need me to. Thankfully, they often tell me, "Uh, don't worry about it. You know, it's kind of interesting how that happened. Um, So I just admit what I don't know. Oftentimes when I talk to the regulators, sometimes it's a matter of, I try not to be, I try to be nice, but I also try not to joke too much or be humorous Yeah, because yeah. I just don't know. Sarcasm is deadly in those scenarios, I think, where you joke about something being bad and then it's taken literally and especially by email, but even on the phone or in person, I just, I'm very careful Almost like I'm being deposed by an attorney in some cases. That's, a, that's the exact, that's the exact uh, 
exactly what I was going to bring up is when, when, when you're talking to lawyers or, or anything like that, the advice is answer the question and yeah. no more, no less. Yeah. So definitely try to keep it on that very much. <laughs> try to make the answers as binary as possible. Yes, no, maybe rare, like rarely say maybe. And I don't know is, is good an answer. <laughs> Typically, I'm not. I don't know as your friend in in those cases. Or or as commonly used in some circles, I don't remember. (laughs) Yeah, well, yeah. (laughs) But I've never never really really been in that scenario. But what I do also, sometimes I just ask for the person to clarify the question better. Um, Yeah. And I do that a lot because sometimes the person asking doesn't know what they're asking for. And Agreed. So I frequently find myself saying, can you clarify what you want here with the data, either the answer, the data, the format. And I also sometimes clarify what it takes to get that data. And I've saved hours of work because I didn't just take the question provided and try to guess at what they needed. Uh, because sometimes it would be like that would take a week of work to pull that data in that format. And then I'm like, what do you really want out of this report the most? And I could give them a summary um, amount of the data in half a day. And they were like, no, no, that's all that we need. That suffices. I'm like, great. So uh, the other thing about regulators that this is just my one experience with the SEC, the SEC folks, like, at least in the financial realm, everyone thinks of the SEC as this draconian group that just wants to you know, shut down a bunch of investors and companies. And what I really found in my experience with them was that there were a lot of folks that kind of had a boring job. They had to go through troves of data and they just wanted to get the stuff in front of them as fast as possible so they could close it up and move on. They really... Oh, agreed. They yeah. were never... I We didn't run into folks, and maybe it was the fact that the executives at my company treated the SEC folks, the regulators, with respect. But and so they never had a presumption of like, oh, we're going to go after a smoking gun here. But we got caught off, we got cut up, cut caught up in the Bernie Madoff scandal only because of um, one of our competitors was tied into it, and so they cons- and so the SEC made a broad sweep of everybody as to like maybe you're all dirty, and we still had a really good audit in that process. But what was the most important thing was that I gave we got them the data that they needed quickly and without a lot of headache. And they were like, oh, wow, you're the easiest company we've audited on this whole thing. We appreciate that. And they were out of our hair fast. So I've always found that dealing with regulators is about check marks and efficiency um, more than a lot of other folks I talk to. So... Yeah, I, I, I think I think that's perfectly fair, um, and and it's a broad generalization. Yeah, um, but for the most part, uh, regulators are probably overworked. Um, they yeah. probably have more to cover than they have the time to do. So the the advice there is as easy as you can make their job, they will make your job easy. Now, if you're um, if we don't suffer from this, but if you happen to be someone that's trying to hide something, I can't help you because I don't, <laughs> I don't work at yeah. companies <laughs> that by their, uh, by the way they do practice or with their ethics, they have to worry about regulators um, hammering them on illegal activities. So right. completely different approach, but thankfully I've always worked at companies that take regulations as, This is a must, something we have to do, but we don't have anything to hide and we're happy to make sure that we're doing things right. And, and in the most, for for the most part, uh, regulations exist for a reason and, and for the most part, good reasons. There are some that you're like, I don't know why we're having to do this, but for the most part, they exist for good reasons. So just finishing out the process and, and helping the, regulator or auditor complete their job is going to make it easier for you. Yep. 
<clears throat> and again, like I would say, we've talked about executives, investors, and regulators, and we're still not talking about code too much. Like I don't have conversations yeah. with these folks at all about. No, they don't. What care. is the code doing? What do you? What code are you using? Like these folks typically don't care about that stuff. Um, For sure. But we've got one more before we get into engineers and users, which are to me dramatically different than these others. Let's talk about the press and media. Um, I don't really interact too much with the press and media because usually there's an executive on the marketing side or a founder that kind of fronts that promotion kind of thing. But what's been your experience, if any, with press and media? So being married to a public relations professional Mm. um, has, has, has opened my eyes a bit, but really for the most part, this is more about uh, again, similar to a lawyer answering the question. Um, It, it, well, let's, there are two scenarios. One is when you're looking for publicity. Yeah. And one is when publicity is finding you. (laughs) Um, Yeah. When publicity is finding you, it's probably best just to answer the question, figure out the angle if yeah. you can, um, and 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 figure out the source as well if you can, um, and and just work with it uh, from there. Figure out if there's a danger of of bad press, yeah, um, and if so, how you want your story told, um. And, and I don't know that it changed that, that particular part changes much when we talk about if you're seeking publicity, then that's more of writing your story and finding people to tell it. Yep. Um, that that's less of a, um, CTO, CAIO responsibility and more like a founder, um, marketing professional. Yeah. Responsibility. But uh, the first time you have a, a breach, you're going to be the one answering the question. <laughs> yeah. You, you hope, hopefully somebody else is going to be answering the questions, but you're going to be right at the forefront. Well, if you want to move, um, up, if you want to move up and up the ladder of an executive rank and you're the people above you that may judge if you can move up the ladder, they have to deal with the press and media most likely at various times. And if they feel that you have to be hidden away from the media and press because you're apt to make off the cuff remarks, bad jokes, say things of controversy, that kind of thing, that's going to hinder your movement up the ladder for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, My experience early on learning about, the media and press was to know what their motivations are one for the discussion and two know like have it in your mind when a discussion point can go down to a sensational headline type of mode. And my first experience was in college. I did an interview where I got a gig with Ernst and young right out of school. And it's a big employer that normally didn't recruit at Georgia. They recruited at like, um, the like Vanderbilts and Emory's and stuff like that. And then they started having to branch out to the state schools. And I got a gig with Ernst and Young and I did an interview with the, a person from the, like either the local paper or the AJC Atlanta journal constitution. <clears throat> and they asked me like, they, we had a whole long interview about the process and what it meant to be working at a company like that. And they asked me what I was going to be making out of school, like the first salary. And I just said, Oh, like 60 K, which was a lot for like late nineties coming right out of college. And right. boom, if the headline wasn't like 60 K for this dude right out of school was like the f- first byline or headline or whatever. It was just right at the forefront of me saying that, and they kind of put it with a brag it like I was bragging about it. And when I had said it, I had said it just like, oh, I'm going to be making 60K. And that's all I said. 
and they the way it was cra- the way it was framed was college kid brags about 60k salary and i was like dang it i just got i like i know how this is going to look to people and i did not say it like that but there's nothing i can i can't take back the statement because it's not inaccurate in that i bragged about loving the job i was going to i they just added the the money in there so i found right. out really quick um that it's very important when talking to media and press especially if your company's product is on a controversial like if you're if you represent uber you better be careful about how you talk about um automated cars and taxi regulations and such because almost every time they get hammered it's because someone makes a comment that's kind of like flippant to the problem and i feel like that's an area that truly i try to avoid it as much as possible like why am i talking to the press on behalf of the company that's a, a public relation person's duty but sometimes you get asked by the executive hey I need someone else to vouch for the company and this is a technical based discussion. Can you do it? And that's when, like you said, it's very much like a regulator. Try not to be funny. Try to be very succinct in your answers. And um, I guess like don't bring attention to yourself as much unless that's really your goal because it's very easy to do so and do it in a way that maybe is not the way you want it to be. Right. And, and I, I don't, the, the times I've had experience, any, any kind of experience with press would be at big companies. So like IBM and like blue shield of California. Yeah. Um, where we'd get the email that would come across and say, Hey, this happened, or this is going to happen. Um, if you receive any inquiries from the press, please direct them to this person at this number, this email address, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so that, that's really the only experience I've had dealing with it is uh, receiving that email going, Hey, uh, yeah, don't answer any questions. Just refer them to this person. Yeah, like never, even if you meet someone out in public and their media, like never take an interview without the marketing or PR person knowing about it beforehand. Like that's just, you almost should never, I mean, I've never done that. So I've never had to suffer the wrath of a scorned PR person, but, um, I know better than to ever agree to talk to someone on the record. And I'm pretty careful about if I know you're a reporter, I'm not going to talk details at all. I don't do that on the record, off the record stuff, but it's, you make sure that a professional that understands how to navigate the media is kind of at the forefront of knowing what's being discussed and making and managing that on your behalf, I guess I would say. Sure. Sure. Um, so let's switch to engineers. Um, now we're, we, this could be a whole episode of how to talk to engineers, but on a more brief level, what's the biggest contrast between talking to executives and regulators and investors, and then switching gears, turning around and talking to the members of your team, the coders, the developers, the testers, the designers, What's your biggest contrast there? Well, in some ways, it's the complete opposite, depending on the uh, depending on what you're doing. So, um, if you're a, a technical executive that's come in to help to help with all those things that we talked about for executives, you know, being able to break the technical into non technical terms and things like that, you may be in charge of a team where you don't know the technology. Yeah. Um, so it could be a complete flip in this case where you're now having to dive into the details to figure out the, the technical of it. Um, and, and, and whether that's 
to a level of actually being able to code in that level language or being able to use that technology is is a different discussion. Um, I think we've talked before about how there was there was one time where I was put in charge of an SAP team, um, and I knew uh, I knew the basics of what SAP did, yeah. but I did not in any way know the details of it. Um, I did not know how to how to how to even do any part of it. So I kept having to get it explained to me and then re-ask it. Uh, re- the way I, I found to do it was have it explained, explain it back in different words and and see if that took you where you needed to be. Yeah. Like I, you're, you made a comment details and I think it's all, it, that's where the biggest contrast is, is detail oriented discussions. Like picking apart every part of the, problem talking about how the solution is going to be handled how it's going to be maintained being able to talk about technology that you don't understand with the vernacular <clears throat> with the vocabulary that is necessary for the to have the discussion so i may use the term database to um the executive team i might say database but when i talk to my technical team, the engineers, I have to talk about Firebase or real-time database. Fire t- Firebase's real-time database versus Firestore or SQL-oriented or document management. Um, like you're now getting into this really low-level um, discussion that, which is, and here's the other thing that's different. You will get judged by other engineers about your use of the vocabulary or what code you find important or not. And like my big, my biggest challenge when I went, when I went to work at a company called DevMind um, was talking to this team of very experienced and opinionated engineers about some of the most mundane detailed approaches to coding something. I was expected to, to hang in those conversations and have an opinion and then find out I was wrong by the voting of the group or whatever, or that's a dumpster fire approach or whatever, you know, it was a much like, I didn't have those t- discussions with executives. I didn't like never did an executive discussion say, Oh, you're going to use my sequel for that. What's wrong with you? Like <laughs> that was never. Yeah part of the choice but i turn around and talk to engineers and you are dealing with detail oriented opinionated um you, you're dealing with anxieties of people like yeah you i think everyone you have to kind of understand anxiety but i found with, with engineers understanding um having more sympathy than just empathy was a big deal for the plight of the work going on and it's just so much different. And I think I, un- I understand why some people in the tech realm are like, I don't want to have to split my brain and talk to these two, all these different stakeholders all the time. It's just easier for me to live in one world. But if we're talking about technology management and leadership, this is where you, the discussion we're having right now about engineers and turning around and talking to the other groups is such a big divide. Um, any other challenges you have working with engineers just on a communication level rather than management, I would say. No, I, I think that's it. And, and in, in addition to that, having to make decisions without complete information. Yeah. So, which I think is almost the, the, uh, might be the d- definition of an executive sometimes. Um, because that's what all the executives that we were just talking about communicating to are doing is making decisions without complete information. Um, so now you're ma- depending on the role, you're making those same decisions without complete understanding of, of what's going on. So you have to get comfortable enough to be able to make a decision. Yeah. I think the, probably the thing that I've noticed the most over the last couple of years as you know, as I've evolved as a manager, is prioritization 
reiterating priorities. Like that's been really big for me. Like it is, it came across, it has come across to me that when I talk to engineers and teams that are um, not experienced as much, that understanding why are we doing this? What is the purpose of this? What should I be working on? Focusing on, and, and for me to be con continuing to remind people, look, our priority here is not the perfect code, it's the best solution. And what does that mean? And reiterating what that means. Like, that's what I find my, like, I don't talk to executives that way. I don't talk to investors that way. They, they have a goal, they set the goal. And when it, I turn around to the engineers, I'm having to formulate the goal, reiterate the goal, break it down, and then also tell people what is not in our priority list. And that's like the bigger struggle or challenge on the engineer side um, for me. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. And then we have users. And I broke those into two subsets. The current, your current user base, and I, it could be it could be such so small that you deal with support, but also potential users. Um, sometimes a company that may want to use your product and they need they have kind of a curiosity about the tech and features involved. What's been your experience on on? Let's talk about current users first. How much do you have to deal with that? Um, there are different levels of users as well. Yeah. Um, there's there's the absolute end user who uses the most basic part of the system, and then there's your your more privileged admins along the way. Um, I think in those cases, it's it's more a case if you're in the situation of talking to them on listening um, to what their concerns are. Um, because they're telling you probably better than you know yourself how how you, what you've put out there is being used. Yeah. Um, and there's certainly discovery that's going to happen where you're going to find out that people are using your system in a completely different way than, than you intended um, and that you may have even built it for. Yeah. Um, so I would say that's the biggest part there is – that it it's some people don't like talking to users, but it is absolutely the most useful thing to you, probably. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's always been talking about experiences um, over, and that includes problems and what's working well. But you know, you need to know motivations of users, but <coughs> you're not going to care about technical details too much. Uh, they care about technical details in the sense of how it relates to their interface with the product. So they don't care about the code you use, but they care about the fact that this looks weird on, our, on their device, on their browser, on their desktop. And so you're always in a mode of when you, when you're talking to a user, especially a current user, you're trying to find out the context more than any of these other groups, I think. Where, why right. are you using this? How are you using it? Why? What's the, what's the environment that you're in? Like you're always diving in to get as much context. And so if I'm talking to an executive team and they ask me about, so you just talked to a group of users, what did you learn from them? And I say, they like it. And that's all I come back with. I've just screwed up the communication between these two teams, these two sides, because what really need, I need to be doing is finding out our user base has this context of their interface with a product. And these are all the opinions they have and experiences they have. And then I turn around to the executive team and boil that down to a one paragraph statement. And that's the, the difference between those two groups. And, and the executive team is more concerned with what will motivate them to buy more, what will motivate them to stay on board for client, for customer retention and increased usage and stuff like that. So that's what I'm, you know, that's the con that's the, the information flow between these two groups 
is you have to wrangle what's important to like all those details about the user experience and the user's motivations and translate that into what matters to the executive team. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Potential users. You're essentially a salesperson in this role, but if you go to a conference and even though you're there as a technical rep, you're still talking to potential users. What's your experience with that? This uh, this is where I, I I especially dive into the motivations, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what what are what are you looking for? Um, and and sometimes and and we do this. We do this once a year. We we go to uh, a conference, all of us, um, that is for the uh, learning management system that we use the most. Um, and it. it we do do the, the, you know, the booth table. Um, and there it's a question of just talking to people, figuring out how they're, what they're doing, um, figuring out how your system fits into what they're looking for. Um, it's not something everybody can do. Yeah. Um, it, it certainly is a case of sometimes, um, the personality is just not one to be salesy. And if you're not salesy, that's okay. Um, you can get by, um, sometimes by just, again, just engaging people in conversation. Yeah. How, how are they using it? Um, what, what would make their jobs easier is a great, um, great way to open people up. Yeah. I mean, I, to that point, I agree with you. You have a, a, you always approach these conversations as though you're a salesperson. Like, and that doesn't mean you have to be salesy. You're not trying to sell them a car. Um, but what you want to ask a person that comes to you to ask about your technology product is what are the problems you're trying to solve? That's or if I don't have anything else to talk to someone about, that's what I go right after is what are the problems you're having? And where, and then I try to map our feature, our product features to their problems and solutions they need. And that's as far as it needs to go typically, because what I don't want to do is waste their time talking about features that they just don't care about. I want to get to the point of why, why are you talking to me right now? And how can I convince you that our feature set is going to solve those problems for you. But the only way I can do that is to get them to talk about their problems um, and their goals of their company. So that's what I go after when I talk to folks. And I keep it brief. Like, again, they don't want a lot of detail. They, I do all the details are for the engineers and the developer development team. The, the potential users just don't have a desire typically to know about how the sausage is made. Um, cause they have a lot of other stuff, things that they need to worry about. Right. Exactly. So if you're just a, let's say you've been developing coding for your whole career briefly, how do you start to interact with these and communicate with these other groups? If you've just been kind of stuck in the corner, um, <laughs> like in the, in a closet coding all the time. What steps do you make to expand your communication skills with these other stakeholding groups? Um, a couple things. One is is you can ask to start to be included in some of the meetings um, so that you can hear how other people are explaining, uh, are, are, are talking to those different uh, groups. And then if, if you're confident enough, you can ask to take responsibility for a certain project. Um, and, and then you're going to be the one having to explain it. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it becomes that simple. Um, and that will give you the experience in figuring out how to break it all down. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think the, the rule of thumb is if you want to, to, if you're at a company that has all these different roles and stuff, it's going to be hard for you to necessarily meet all these people within your own company. Um, 
because you're not going to be a, like depending on where you are on the totem pole, you're not going to be brought into an investor meeting. Um, but I would say going to meetups that are not related to your field is a great way to meet people. Like I went to a product management meeting early on in, in Chicago where I met all these people, designers and product managers that I'm like, oh, I didn't even know people did this. Like, I thought this was all the coders. And I learned so much from that one weekend session where I was the only developer in the room talking to all these people that thought coders were just little hermits that never spoke to and never came out for the sun kind of thing. And right. <clears throat> learned a tremendous amount there. And then like I did a stint as an intern for the press relations at the Olympics in 1996, which I was in college. So I had time to do this kind of thing, but I learned a lot about the media um, and how it, it operated in a really high pressure kind of two week scenario. And then over the years, I found myself, um, I worked on, I donated time to the Taproot Foundation which puts basically all these different groups, all the stakeholders we just talked about, get into a room once a week for about 10 to 12 weeks and build a website for a company. And everybody in that room is deemed the expert at their role and has to work together. There are no, there's no ladder. There's only, you have to talk to a volunteer marketing person, a volunteer writer, a volunteer project manager. There's an executive on the team and everyone treats each other with the same level of respect of in order for this thing to get done in the short amount of time, there is no hierarchy. We have different roles, but there is no, everyone's important has to talk and communicate. I learned so much talk, like working on those projects because this, the, the pro bono side of it and the timeline of it, forced everyone to get real fast despite their differences in their roles. Um, sure. Like I feel that you, you're going to have to put yourself out there, but don't try to, I, I just don't think that working in your own company, like the, asking your own company to be the source of your exposure to all the parties is a little bit too much. The hierarchy is there for a reason and it's protected by people. And if you really want to branch out and, learn how to communicate with these groups, you need to go outside of the comfort of your company confines and just start meeting people and talking to them um, in other scenarios and other meetups and other networking. And that's the best way to get that experience, I think. All right. So I have a question. Yep. Did we, did we pick up a sponsorship uh, from meetup.com that I'm not aware of? No, but they're, they had, well, that's funny because <clears throat> I was talking to a group of people the other day and, and I'm, and we were talking about meetups and someone has said, yeah. man, meetups are dead in this meetup.com's fault. And I was like, I, and it's interesting that that's the way it was phrased, but I also, I'm, I don't, I don't know it's the meetup.com's fault, but something about meetups has changed in the last three or four years in Chicago, at least. And I don't Weird. know. Okay. I don't know why, but it, to me right now, if you want to know about meetups in Chicago, it's really the only way to go um, for the most part. Yeah. But it's not, I don't know that they are good for the meetup industry either. And I don't, I don't know if it's because you can join and anyone can join a meetup. And then say they're going to go and then they don't. I mean, every meetup I go to has 50 to 60 people signed up to go and then 20, like one third of them show up. Well, I, yeah. And, and I, I, full disclosure, I did that just last night. I had I'd signed up for something yeah. and I, I it was on my calendar and I, I couldn't make it, but I didn't go in and change my RSVP either. Oh, I'm um, guilty. Which I should have done. I'm totally guilty of it too. So, yeah, it's not. It's, it's um, not but but, but I, 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 yeah, I, I, I find it really hard to blame Meetup.com for that because without Meetup.com, I, I, 
the whole industry wouldn't, I won't say it wouldn't exist because somebody else would have filled the void. Um, but in no other, in, in the same way, they would have filled the void. It's not so, so much I'm blank, like they aren't doing anything wrong. I guess I'm th- thinking they make it so easy to half assed commit to it. Maybe that's it. I don't know. I don't know what the dynamic yeah, is. That's not. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't see that as their their fault. At all. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. I'm not totally sure. Well, I, and and I'll, I'll what I'll say in regards to that is for Florida Drupal Camp, the first Florida Drupal Camp or two we did, we did um, for free, um, and we found that problem. Yeah. So we found the problem of. We're getting 180 RSVPs and we're only seeing 120 people, so we can't properly prepare. Um, we're over buying food. We're over buying everything that we needed. Yeah. Um, so we started charging. Uh, charging is the best way to to get around that problem for sure. The other thing is high um, but high with- value content at the meeting, like. I, I don't know how many meetups sure. I go to, and I'm just like, this was not well organized. The networking went on for at least 30 minutes longer than getting to the point of the meeting. And then whoever did the meeting, like whoever did the presentation wasn't prepared. I'm like, this whole thing was a, just a waste of time. And sure, like when you do that enough times, you just get demotivated to attending. Yeah, that's a that's completely off the <laughs> off the rails on this. One. <laughs> well, we got we got talking we got talking about all the positives of it. Yeah. So so uh, I, it was interesting to see how we got there. <laughs> but yeah, all right. Well, I think this is a, a good one. Um, we covered a lot of ground. I've lost track of time. So yeah, uh, anything else about stakeholders that you want to throw in there? No, I think we've hit everything. Cool. All right, we'll talk next week. All right. Sounds good. See ya. Thanks for listening to the CTO Think Podcast. Show notes and previous episodes can be found on our website at ctothink.com. Reviews on Apple iTunes are always appreciated and help promote the show. Patreon contributions help us to produce episode transcripts, which allow people that are deaf or hard of hearing to access the show. If you have feedback, ideas, or want to be a guest, please email us at hello at ctothink.com. Show music is Dumpster Dive by Mark Wallach. Licensed by PremiumBeat.com. Voiceover work by MeganVoices.com. You'll hear from us next week. Thank you.